Chapter Eleven of Undine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pete Williams. Undine by Friedrich de la Motte Fouquet. Translated by F. E. Bunnett. Chapter Eleven The Anniversary of Bertalda's Name Day. The company were sitting at dinner, Bertalda looking like some goddess of spring with her flowers and jewels, the presence of her foster parents and friends, was placed between Undine and Huldbrand. When the rich repast was ended, and the last course had appeared, the doors were left open, according to a good old German custom, that the common people might look on and take part in the festivity of the nobles. Servants were carrying round cake and wine among the spectators. Huldbrand and Bertalda were waiting with secret impatience for the promised explanation, and sat with their eyes fixed steadily on Undine. But the beautiful wife still continued silent, and only kept smiling to herself with secret and hearty satisfaction. All who knew of the promise she had given could see that she was every moment on the point of betraying her happy secret, and that it was with a sort of longing renunciation that she withheld it, just as children sometimes delay the enjoyment of their choicest morsels. Bertelda and Huldbrand shared this delightful feeling, and expected with fearful hope the tidings which were to fall from the lips of Undine. Several of the company pressed Undine to sing. The request seemed opportune, and ordering her lute to be brought, she sang the following words. Bright opening day, wild flowers so gay, Tall grasses their thirst that slake, On the banks of the billowy lake. What glimmers there so shining, The reedy growth entwining? Is it a blossom white as snow, Fallen from heaven here below? It is an infant, frail and dear, With flowerets playing in its dreams, And grasping morning's golden beams, O oh, whence, sweet stranger, art thou here? From some far-off and unknown strand the lake has borne thee to this land. Nay, grasp not, tender little one, with thy tiny hand outspread. No hand will meet thy touch with love. Mute is that flowery bed. The flowers can deck themselves so fair, and breathe forth fragrance blessed. Yet none can press thee to itself, like that far-off mother's breast. So early at the gate of life, with smiles of heaven on thy brow, Thou hast the best of treasures lost, poor wandering child, nor knowest it now. A noble duke comes riding by, and near thee checks his courser's speed, And full of ardent chivalry he bears thee home upon his steed. Much, endless much, has been thy gain, thou bloomest the fairest in the land, Yet, ah, the priceless joy of all! thou'st left upon an unknown strand. Undine dropped her lute with a melancholy smile, and the eyes of Bertalda's foster parents were filled with tears. Yes, so it was on the morning that I found you, my poor sweet orphan, said the duke, deeply agitated. The beautiful singer is certainly right. We have not been able to give you that priceless joy of all. But we must... Also hear how it fared with the poor parents, said Undine, as she resumed her lute and sang. Through every chamber roams the mother, moves and searches everywhere, seeks she scarce knows what with sadness, and finds an empty house is there. An empty house, O oh, word of sorrow, to her who once had been so blessed, who led her child about by day and cradled it at night to rest. The beach is growing green again, the sunshine gilds its wonted spot, but, mother, cease thy searching vain. Thy little loved one cometh not. And when the breath of eve blows cool, and father in his home appears, the smile he almost tries to wear is quenched at once by gushing tears. Full well he knows that in his home he not can find but wild despair. He hears the mother's grieved lament, and no bright infant greets him there. "'Oh, for God's sake, Undine, wh where are my parents?' cried the weeping Bertelda. "'You surely know. You have discovered them, you wonderful being, for otherwise you would not have thus torn my heart.' 
are they perhaps already here? Can it be? Her eyes passed quickly over the brilliant company and lingered on a lady of high rank who was sitting next her foster father. Undine, however, turned toward the door while her eyes overflowed with the sweetest emotion. Where are the poor waiting parents, she inquired, and the old fisherman and his wife advanced hesitatingly from the crowd of spectators. Their glance rested inquiringly now on Undine, now on the beautiful girl who was said to be their daughter. It is she, said the delighted benefactress in a faltering tone, and the two old people hung round the neck of their recovered child, weeping and praising God. But amazed and indignant, Bertalda tore herself from their embrace. Such a recognition was too much for this proud mind. At a moment when she had surely imagined that her former splendor would even be increased, and when hope was deluding her with a vision of almost royal honors. It seemed to her as if her rival had devised all this on purpose, signally to humble her before Huldbrand and the whole world. She reviled Undine, she reviled the old people, and bitter invectives such as deceiver and bribed impostors fell from her lips. Then the old fisherman's wife said in a low voice to herself, Ah, me! She has become a wicked girl, and yet I feel in my heart that she is my child. The old fisherman, however, had folded his hands and was praying silently that this might not be his daughter. Undine, pale as death, turned with agitation from the parents to Bertelda, and from Bertelda to the parents, suddenly cast down from that heaven of happiness of which she had dreamed and overwhelmed with a fear and a terror such as she had never known, even in imagination. "'Have you a soul? Have you really a soul, Bertalda? she cried again and again to her angry friend, as if forcibly to rouse her to consciousness from some sudden delirium or maddening nightmare. But when Bertalda only became more and more enraged, when the repulsed parents began to weep aloud, and the company, in eager dispute, were taking different sides, she begged in such a dignified and serious manner to be allowed to speak in this her husband's hall, that all around were in a moment silenced. She then advanced to the upper end of the table, where Bertalda had seated herself, and with a modest and yet proud air, while every eye was fixed upon her, she spoke as follows. "'My friends, you look so angry and disturbed, and you have interrupted my happy feast by your disputings.' Ah, I knew nothing of your foolish habits and your heartless mode of thinking, and I shall never all my life long become accustomed to them. It is not my fault that this affair has resulted in evil. Believe me, the fault is with yourselves alone, little as it may appear to you to be so. I have therefore but little to say to you, but one thing I must say. I have spoken nothing but truth. I neither can nor will give you proofs beyond my own assertion, but I will swear to the truth of this. I received this information from the very person who allured Bertalda into the water, away from her parents, and who afterward placed her on the green meadow in the duke's path. "'She is an enchantress,' cried Bertalda, "'a witch who has intercourse with evil spirits. She acknowledges it herself.' "'I do not,' said Undine, with a whole heaven innocence and confidence beaming in her eyes. "'I am no witch. Only look at me.' She is false and boastful, interrupted Bertelda, and she cannot prove that I am the child of these low people. My noble parents, I beg you, take me from this company and out of this city, where they are only bent on insulting me. But the aged and honorable duke remained unmoved, and his wife said, We must thoroughly examine how we are to act. God forbid that we should move a step from this hall until we have done so. Then the old wife of the fisherman drew near, and making a low reverence to the duchess, she said, Noble, God-fearing lady, you have opened my heart. I must tell you, if this evil-disposed young lady is my daughter, she has a mark, like a violet, between her shoulders, and another like it on the instep of her left foot. If she would only go out of the hall with me. I shall not uncover myself before the peasant woman, exclaimed Bertelda proudly turning her back on her. "'But before me you will,' rejoined the Duchess very gravely. 
Follow me into that room, girl, and the good old woman shall come with us. The three disappeared, and the rest of the company remained where they were, in silent expectation. After a short time, they returned. Bertalda was pale as death. "'Right is right,' said the Duchess. "'I must therefore declare that our hostess has spoken perfect. Truth. Bertalda is the fisherman's daughter, and that is as much as it is necessary to inform you here.' The princely pair left with their adopted daughter, and at a sign from the duke the fisherman and his wife followed them. The other guests retired in silence, or with secret murmurs, and Undine sank weeping into Huldbrand's arms. End of chapter 11 Recording by Pete Williams, Pittsburgh, PA